Dan Olds here, and this is another installment of my HPC blog. I'm here at ISC 15 with a couple of very special guests. First one, who I guess shouldn't need an introduction, but for those of you who haven't been around the industry or aren't as deep in the industry, this is Bo Ewald, a former CEO of Cray, former CEO of SGI, veteran of many a startup, and you're now the, what's your official title at D-Wave? Well, that's a good question, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and thank you. That's going to be our first question. That's what we're going to do in the podcast here today. So uh, nominally, I'm the president, and then also help look after all of the customer ah, uh, activities. Okay. In the so really, customer related things. And, and you know, to kick this off, you're at a point in your career with the experience you've had. You could do anything. You could do nothing if you wanted to, right? What is it about D-Wave and quantum computing that brought you back into this first let me let me tell you a little story about okay. careers and this this goes back you've had a couple <laughs> i've had several but actually i was at a meeting what, what the story i was going to tell was probably from 25 years ago mm -hmm. or something and i was at a similar event as this and was sitting there with seymour cray and les davis and someone oh, else wow. and someone came up and said you know i was with these real luminaries and someone came up to me as this young kid Relative, relatively, and uh, said, boy, you've had quite a career, Bo. Bo. And Seymour turned, and he said, he hasn't had a career at all, but he's had a heck of a lot of interesting jobs. <laughs> and, that, and, and that is really the way I think about it, is that I have, okay. have had a whole collection of interesting jobs. I've never thought, sort of, never had a plan, a mm -hmm. career plan, or those sorts of things. But uh, with D-Wave, I had known some of the investors, mm -hmm. and uh, probably three or four years ago, they asked if I would... Uh, you know, go up to Vancouver and meet the uh, the then new, relatively new CEO, Vern Brownell, and, uh, you know, provide any advice I could. So I did sure. that. And then uh, I thought, you know, as the company matured a little bit and actually had a product and was then looking like we could get some customers that I thought it would be a fun thing to help out with. Mm. And so amongst other things, they talked to me about maybe being on the board or something like that. And I said, you know, I'm really not a very good board guy. Yeah. I don't play golf. <laughs> and I kind of, you know, rather be in the fire yeah. than be sitting around the fire. And so maybe I can help out. Throwing an occasional stick on I, the fire. I, you want to be in the middle of it. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And uh, so with that, I, you know, uh, we came to an agreement to, you know, see if I could help the company. And so decided to do that. And, you know, I don't know what retirement is supposed to be, but... Mm. But by some definitions, I think it's getting to do interesting things with interesting people in interesting places. And that sounds a lot like what we're doing here. What is it about so, this technology that attracts you to it? Yeah, so that, that actually is, be, besides all of this yeah. baloney I've just been through. No, but that's, that the, was good. The uh, really interesting thing about the technology is that it is so different, it is so unique, that I think we're at the leading edge of a, a brand new paradigm for computing. And in fact, I believe that we have a greater potential to change the face of computing with what we're doing to D-Wave than we did at those great companies like Cray Research and Silicon Graphics. Wow. So, and I want to be involved in that. I've always worked on things that were at the state of the art, were interesting, were first class companies, and I think- Those we were the, the years when you were at those companies. Yeah. Absolutely were, yeah. So, so I, I think the same things, uh, I think the same thing, but maybe even greater, there's greater really? potential to change the face here. But the wow. reality is that, that with D-Wave today, it's almost like we're in 1952 or 1953 mm -hmm. or something in the traditional computing industry mm -hmm. because our equivalent of the Fortran compiler hasn't been invented yet. Donald Knuth hasn't written books about algorithms. Okay. Um, Everything's are, roll your every, own. It is. It is. And the first, and when someone does something on one of our computers, it is probably the first time that it's ever been done on a quantum computer. Wow. For, so... So then that's exciting, interesting. And so I so we're not at the point where I can ask you, you have RAID on the motherboard? Of this? <laughs> no, you <laughs> no. could ask that. <laughs> and you, and you and know have you the slap answer. me. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Well, we yeah. also have Murray Tom with us as well. And Murray's one of the young Turks, I guess, in this whole quantum wave, so to speak. Uh, what is it that, that captures your imagination? What's the potential of quantum computing? Well, the, um, you know, I originally got into the space uh, after I'd seen a lecture from uh, Jordy Rose in uh, 2002. Actually, I think that was probably closer to 2000, 2001. When you were 14? Yeah, yeah, when yeah, you, yeah. You really look young. <laughs> in a good way. You're yeah. going to love that. That's going to be great for you. <laughs> Isn't it? Oh, he's got it, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And um, at that time, 
we were, you know, when I got into the space of building quantum computers, I was excited about the idea of whether we could even build a machine or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, once we had built our first machines and Lockheed Martin uh, purchased our first one, we, we had customers. Um, you know, the, the great appeal about quantum computing is that what we can use it for, it's like a tool. So being able to put a, a tool in people's hands and, and seeing what they can do with it, I think has probably been really exciting. And, and the potential for um, really powerful growth in this in this technology space, allowing us to solve problems we haven't solved before, I think is what's what's really exciting. It gets me out of bed from day to day. But we're still at the point where we don't know what this tool is. Is it a hammer? Is it a screwdriver? Is it a, uh, a knife? Right? That's the... That's the also you're finding new uses for part of the exciting part. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of exploring new ground, and uh, and sort of uh, peeling back the layers of, of what the technology can do, how to make it better, and uh, and finding the ways to uh, to put it into application. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's you know working on the most challenging problems. That's that's sort of what we we talk about with our customers and partners. That's what we want to help them do, and and that's also you know a big part of our own culture in terms of what we want to do and helping people out. And I know that the, it's so early, there's no typical use case, but when you go into a customer, either one of you, what do you say? To How do you start out that conversation? It's not, we've got quantum computers, you know, press hard on this PO because the fourth copy is yours. It's probably a bit more than that. How do you introduce the concept to them? Well... <clears throat> Let me first make a comment about Murray. As you noted, he does look young. However, yes. he is one of the senior members from D-Wave. He's, he's been around. He's been with the company it. for a dozen years or something, something like that. Something like, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, in, uh, you know, Again, our, starting when he was 12. <laughs> well, exactly. And that's, yeah. been, that's been one of the jokes that we had. And about a year or so ago, we were giving a thing to some customers in the UK. And I said those very words. I said, mm -hmm. you know, Murray's a senior member. He started with us when he was about 12 or something <laughs> like that. After the meeting was over, a fellow came up to both of us and said, did you really start? with a company when you were 12? Here in the UK, we have labor laws, and you wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> I, I would hope, was, I would hope that you would have said, uh, no, he was just an intern. <laughs> right, exactly. That was his summer job. <laughs> exactly. He also mowed lawns and stuff, but he was an intern. Yeah. But, you know, but, but that actually is part of the point to the, mm -hmm. the question you ask, and the technology that we have is so different that people my age have grown up with this other technology. It takes new, fresh minds to think about how to use this, and so Murray is yeah. a wonderful example of that. In, in your briefing, it was really hard for me to get around this, because I keep trying to put things in terms of, of digital um, right. analogies to be able to figure it out, and it just doesn't work. Exactly, exactly. So, so to your question of how do we talk with folks about this, um, basically what we say is that we do have this new tool and it has some really unique characteristics, and it's got some things that are going to make it really hard to use and a little frustrating for you. But what it looks like it will be good at are solving three classes of problems. Mm -hmm. A particular type of optimization problems, probably machine learning, which is what Google bought it for. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, it looks like it'll be good at Monte Carlo and sampling sorts of things. But again, we're early days. We sure. don't have the equivalent of Those are some compilers. pretty big niches. Those are big niches. Yeah. Um, but what we also say is that it's going to take a lot of work on your part and ours. It's mm -hmm. going to take a real partnership for us to look at your particular problem and see how to sort of reconstruct it rather than mm -hmm. deconstruct it, but go back to the basic problem you're trying to solve and be able to put it on this engine and see if we can solve it. But if that works, we're not talking about you know solving a problem twice as fast or three times as fast. We're talking about orders of magnitude, right? We are. Um, and we don't have many examples of no. that yet, but the, the uh, first and probably the best one of those today uh, came from Google. So before mm -hmm. Google bought the machine, they wanted to solve they ask us to work with them and, and sort of set a, uh, run a set of two sets of problems. One mm -hmm. were benchmarks, which you and I would call performance characterization mm -hmm. as opposed to a customer-oriented benchmark. Sure. It was really performance characterization of the machine. And so they gave us a set of synthetic benchmarks that were aimed at sort of figuring out the performance envelope of this machine. Um, much like Linpack might be in mm -hmm. the HPC mm -hmm. world, but not as sophisticated as Linpack. Sure. Um, and so, and, and then they wanted to run those on commercial off-the-shelf optimization software, which mm -hmm. they did. Um, so, 
when we ran those at small problem sizes, we were losing, uh, you know, the, the traditional machines were a hundred times faster than we were. Mm. When the node size got up so that it was about a hundred qubits on our machines, we and the traditional machines were about equal. So is it scaled? And then as it got larger, and, and at the time we were testing on a 500 qubit machine, mm -hmm. we in fact were about 10,000 times faster. That's not bad. <laughs> now, that's a win. That's, that was, that was that's a win. That's a win. Yeah. Sure. That, and yeah. uh, that was, again, one, one test, one, one test, case, one benchmark, a point in time. But the, put to you by some fairly sophisticated folks. Yeah, you would think it's so. Not <laughs> <laughs> it's not spec No, no. So, and we think so there's some there promise were, there. There's there, something there is promise, right? Here. Exactly. So I think that was that really was what got Google and others' attention is, gee, if you really could map a problem onto this. Mm -hmm. Again, these were synthetic benchmarks. Sure. They weren't their real application. They were tuned to be able to run well on this machine. Uh, but that shows the promise of it. And then in the intervening two years, in fact, we just at this conference been showing some people how um, by interpreting the problem a little differently, uh, Murray and his team, in fact, have gotten us now, so we're even faster than that compared to those original benchmarks. And one of the things that Murray brought up in the briefing that uh, we had was the, the hockey team problem. It's an example of the kind of problem that this is good at. And if I, can, if, if I could summarize it, that it's along the lines of, let's say you have a universe of 2,000 players, and you need to pick the best hockey team. And you're going to look at variables as to how each individual player plays, but also how do they play when they're matched with these folks or against these other folks? And you keep adding more and more variables, and you can take it from here as to uh, what quantum uh, computing has to offer for that kind of problem. Yeah, so the interesting thing about the technology is, is to think about it as sort of like um, solving a very particular problem. So, so what, as you were saying in the, in the hockey team example, uh, part of what makes that difficult is that when you're selecting a player to be on your team or off your team, you can't, uh, you can't use a weight. You can't take a part of the player. They're either there or they're not. Mm -hmm. And that basically makes the search space um, very large. It's combinatorially large. And if the hockey players didn't interact with one another, it would be easy because you sure. could just do sort of independent assessments of each player. But it's the relationships between them, the correlations there, that um, link the search space and, and make it very challenging for classical computers. And one of the features that the quantum processor can do that no classical technology can do is it, it can begin by searching the entire solution space simultaneously and then very quickly converge, localize on a, a team which is a very high quality team. And it, it does that by, and we often refer to it as, it's a minimization task. So it's searching the landscape of all the possible teams it could be, it mm -hmm. could be choosing and finding the, the low point of that landscape. So if you think about the chip as sort of like a, a quantum experiment, that quantum experiment is minimizing its energy. Mm. Interesting. And from there, I mean, every time you add a parameter, you're exponentially making the problem more difficult. Yeah, that's, well. the, that's the amazing part. And when we turned down the first uh, D-Wave 2 machines with 512 qubits, there was sort of that moment where we realized, you know, this is searching a, a solution space that's larger than the estimated number of particles in the universe. So that's, I find that that's just large. as large, that's, very mind-blowing, yeah. That's very large. Um, very interesting stuff. And there's, there are some hurdles that customers need to, to get past. They need to be able to define their problem. Uh, the machines are not desk side, I wouldn't say. And uh, I thought one of the really interesting technologies that I think uh, you folks at home will enjoy, particularly the register readers, is that uh, the processors kept it minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. That's, that's correct, yeah. So it superconducts at that temperature. That's right. That's right. Quantum, uh, the quantum world is a very delicate world that's easily disturbed. So in order to make a processor that can pour, perform these powerful calculations, um, we effectively need to... Um, separated and isolated from all forms of noise and disturbance and temperature is one of those forms so it's uh, it's housed you know in an ultra low temperature refrigerator and um, the nice condition there as you were saying about the superconductivity is that the processors that we're used to running in our laptops and our phones operate at room temperature and when you turn them on they heat up in this system the operating temperature is a very low temperature but when you turn it on because of the superconductivity it doesn't produce any heat in the processor interesting 
And in, in fact, Dan, the, you know, when you look at our systems and the, the images that folks will see of the systems, they look large. They're, mm -hmm. The container is about 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet. Yeah. And for Murray, that's three meters by, by three, three meters, meters by, by three, three meters. meters. Yeah. <laughs> but about a, a cube that's about 10 feet. The, the computer, the processor itself, is no bigger than your thumbnail. Uh, exactly. And that's sort of right at the heart of it. So this whole bot, the, the, the system that you see is filled mostly with air. Mm -hmm. And uh, we built, built it that size so that, in fact, we could have, as we're working on it, we could have two or three people in working on the refrigeration of the system. So um, it's itself. completely so it's, electrically isolated and shielded it, and thermally. It, it, exactly. And she, so shielded from radio frequency, we have to cancel out magnetism, we have to do a whole variety of things because, as Murray says, it is... It's a huge um, bunch of engineering hurdles. A, a tremendous amount of engineering has gone into it. So the physics is impressive, and the engineering and manufacturing technology are equally impressive to be able to, to do that. But the reality is the system itself really is no bigger than your thumbnail. It, it, yeah, if I saw that, just a yeah. very tiny It looks like That's a regular it. chip that we would see. It's got a couple of special characteristics to uh, it. Yeah, there's some, <laughs> there's, there, there, are, there are some secret sauce in there, yeah. of course. Yeah. But this has just been fascinating. And uh, I assume that if anybody goes to the D-Wave website, they can see uh, more. And throughout this, this talk here, I'm going to be having some slides uh, just to give people a little bit more information. But uh, best of luck to you two, and thank you Great. for taking the time. Great, Great stuff. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate the interest. And those of you who are listening, really appreciate your taking the time to uh, look at what we're doing. It's great. It, it is revolutionary, and it is going to change the face of computing, we think, more than uh, some of the historical anything companies else. and technologies have. It certainly seems like it has that promise. Great. Thanks thank, again. Thanks so much, Dan. Appreciate it.